What should patients know about bispecific antibody therapy and the risk for infection? Well, I think that's an excellent question. What should patients know about bispecific antibodies and the risk of infection? So a bispecific antibody pulls together a, 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 a tumor cell and an immune cell. And in the case of myeloma, the, the therapies that are being developed right now target B cell maturation antigen. So that's on myeloma cells, but it's also on normal B cells that are making normal antibodies that you need to fight infection. So that's what happens is people are on bispecifics, they'll have very low levels of normal antibodies. So you should be aware that that's a risk. Many people are offered intravenous gamma globulin as sort of a substitute, a, a fill-in, if you will, of normal antibodies given monthly. But certainly there's some data out there that if you had, for example, a COVID infection and you're on treatment with that, really should take that quite seriously and seek out the appropriate treatment, whether it's the oral antiviral Paxlovid or whether it's one of the antibody treatments. But there is a higher risk of infection and perhaps having a more serious infection. So that's a great question. So these bispecific antibodies, they target a receptor that's present on normal plasma cells and cancerous or malignant plasma cells. So that receptor is BCMA. There are some other receptors as well. So BCMA, because it's present on normal plasma cells, and plasma cells are the cells that fight infection and they generate antibodies, these drugs, they're so effective at depleting normal plasma cells that there's an, a definitely an increased risk of infection. And this, you know, all of our drugs, one way or another, they deplete plasma cells. That's how, you know, myeloma treatment works, right? You kill those cancerous plasma cells. But by specifics, uh, appear to be particularly good at killing abnormal malignant plasma cells as well as those normal plasma cells that, that fight infection. So we definitely are seeing more infections than we otherwise see um, in, 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 in these patients. Now, a lot of these infections are, you know, viruses that, um, you know, upper respiratory infections, viruses that circulate in the community. But sometimes we see more rare forms of bacterial infections, fungal infections. There is a huge spectrum of infections that has been reported in, in the clinical trials. So it's definitely something that we're all very concerned about, very vigilant about. Um, and I think that appropriate um, antibiotic prophylaxis is something that we definitely should consider. Um, and that would include, you know, some an antiviral like acyclovir or valacyclovir um, that can decrease the likelihood of shingles. That's usually something people are on. But I think we also sort of need to be thinking outside the box. Should we be covering for other more rare types of infections? Like there's like PJP pneumonia. Should, should we also be giving like medications like Bactrim to try to prevent that? What about giving people um, IVIG, right? Like pooled antibodies from, from donors. That might have a role as well. So this is something that is an area of further investigation. And I think that as we use more and more bispecifics and as we use these drugs earlier, we're going to learn more about the side effect profile and we're going to get better at managing it. But for today, it's very, it's very important to counsel our patients about these risks. Should patients be up to date with their vaccines? So I think that some protection is better than none. And we want to make sure that they're up to date on vaccines. If it is at all possible, um, it's probably better to start the vaccination before you start treatment. So that is something that we that holds true for, let's say, daratumumab, right? If you, if you know somebody's about to start daratumumab next week or, or a few weeks later, you probably want to start the vaccines a little earlier before you put them on those treatment. But we often don't have that luxury, right? When people need treatment, they need treatment and you can't delay it. But I would argue that you'd, um, some protection is better than no protection. And generally speaking, if there's an important vaccine that they haven't gotten yet, and that includes COVID, that includes the flu vaccine, um, that includes the, the pneumonia vaccines, if they haven't gotten it yet, then you, we probably should, even though we know that they're probably not going to mount the same response that they would have if they weren't on this treatment. What types of personal protection should individuals who are prescribed by specific antibody therapy consider? So we definitely have seen upper viral upper respiratory infections in patients on bispecific therapies, and they have the potential to be more severe. Now, I think that everybody weighs the risks and benefits differently. So I have conversations with my patients. I do generally tell them that if they're going in, you know, crowded indoor areas, um, they probably ought to wear a high quality mask. 
Um, and that would mean, you know, good, well-fitting N95 or a KN95. I, you know, it's hard to know the exact magnitude of protection that that's, protect, that's providing, but at least I believe that it is providing some protection. And I think it makes sense to do that for, you know, crowded indoor areas or flights, et cetera, especially if you are on bispecific therapies. I don't ask people to stop living their lives, right? Um, you know, people have been making these risk benefit decisions before COVID was a thing. There were other respiratory viruses. So everybody sort of views these risks and benefits differently. But I do think the use of masks, especially in high risk environments, um, makes sense for these people who are immunocompromised. What should individuals know about eating out at a restaurant? It's a very, obviously a very controversial topic. Um, and I think that, you know, everybody weighs these these risks differently. I've had these conversations with my patients. I was like, you know, even before COVID, like, you know, you, you would catch other respiratory infections when you would go to restaurants. And now, well, you can catch them and you can also catch COVID. But it's part of living a normal life, right? And I think that different people weigh those risks differently. And I also think that, you can't think of a one-size-fits-all approach for patients with myeloma. Depending on where you're at in your treatment journey, the risk of COVID and the risk of immunosuppression might be very different, right? But some discretion is probably a good thing. I probably would like them to avoid very crowded indoor public areas, uh, especially if their counts are low on their own by specifics. What testing is used to monitor a patient's increased risk for infection? Really what you look at is many of the patients people on bispecific treatments have very undetectable antibody levels. And so I think if, if, if certainly if a person knows that they have that situation, that would be a, a person that would be recommended for that intravenous gamma globulin. Probably also prophylactic antibiotics sometimes are used. So for example, a drug like sulfamethioprim trimethoprim, um, like Bactrim is sometimes given for prophylaxis or Levaquin, something like that. I think you should be vaccinated for sure. Um, again, you may not have antibodies that we can detect, but vaccines are probably very useful. So again, if you're on a bispecific, I would make sure your vaccines are up to date. So bispecifics are very, very effective against the myeloma cells. But uh, because of this, they also wipe out uh, the normal plasma cells, which are responsible with the production of, of antibodies. So patients uh, get to a state of what we call hypogamma globulinemia. It means that their antibody levels are really very, very low, and this uh, can certainly uh, cause uh, uh, um, vulnerability towards infections. And one way to overcome this is uh, a treatment with IV gamma globulins called IVIG, administered uh, once a month, uh, usually uh, intravenously, though there is now even a sub-Q uh, formulations becoming available. And so this certainly can help uh, uh, with infections. Uh, also, uh, there's antiviral prophylaxis that is, uh, that is giving B PJP uh, prophylaxis. Uh, all these, uh, these measures can uh, certainly be, uh, be helpful. And of course, uh, uh, if there is any sign of infection, it's wise to, uh, to seek uh, medical attention as soon as possible, knowing that the immune uh, system is uh, compromised. So a uh, rapid intervention with antibiotic can be of, uh, of great importance. Is treatment stopped if an individual develops an infection? So uh, uh, the way we manage uh, um, infections, usually uh, uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, put the treatment on hold uh, while the patient has an active infection, we treat the infection. And uh, usually we try and resume uh, uh, the treatment uh, if it's possible to uh, uh, apply uh, measures like uh, preventive uh, measures, then that's uh, a good thing uh, to do. What does the clinical trial data tell us about infection rate? So bispecific antibody therapies are uh, this new class of uh, immune therapy that we have approved for patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. So this is approved for patients who've got uh, four or more lines of therapy, and we have currently an FDA-approved product called Teclistumab that is approved for our patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. So the risk of infection with uh, BCMA targeting bispecific antibody um, has been observed across various phase one, two studies and also from real-world data set, and it's approaching in the 70 to 80 percent range, and about 50 percent of these infections are what we call severe infection or grade three and higher infection. In addition, we also find that uh, uh, somewhere between um, 8 percent of patients had a grade five event, meaning that infection leading to, uh, uh, to death. 
which is very concerning uh, for our patients. And it's uh, at least in our uh, in our data set, we've we've noted that the patients who had an infection passed away were mostly in um, remission uh, and deep remissions where by their they had an MRD negative uh, complete response in the bone marrow. Uh, so this is obviously very concerning to us. Um, so uh, we, as a myeloma community, are working on optimizing uh, infection monitoring and prophylactic strategies that can minimize the risk of infection. And hopefully uh, in the next uh, uh, one to two months, we will have uh, you know publications coming out. We already had seen a publication from um, the um, uh, European Myeloma Network, which um, uh, kind of outlines the infection preventative strategies that we could employ for patients who are getting by specific as well as CAR-T therapy. Um, and there are several ongoing studies that we've seen at um, uh, the ASCO 2023 meeting investigating alternative um, um, treatment schedules whereby instead of going weekly, uh, some of these agents are going to go every two weekly, specifically teclistumab. And we also have ongoing clinical trials uh, that will uh, investigate a fixed duration of teclistumab. Mm-hmm.